Hey everyone and happy Monday. It is time as always for Ask Mike with our senior analyst Mike Irwin and I know we've got some pretty interesting questions of course regarding the NCAA baseball tournament. A lot of questions, a lot of people upset. But yeah. I think Razorback fans kind of adopted North Carolina right. State after they I beat did. Arkansas. They wanted them to win it all and they wanted to be able to say, well, we lost to the one team that nobody else could beat in Omaha. Yeah. So, I mean, makes sense, yeah, make and especially with, with what happened to them. So let's just jump right into right. it. Our first question is from Razorback Redneck, who says the NCAA has ruined the college baseball season by removing North Carolina State from the College World Series because of its inflexible COVID protocols. Four vaccinated players tested positive, so their season is over. Come on, what's the point of vaccinations then? You know, boy, there's Fair. so many things you could talk about on this. I think we got to start with the fact that if they were going to have these rigid, these protocols that they're using, and they, the NCAA sort of changed things up with each different sport. Yeah. They had different sports, different protocols for the NCAA basketball tournament, different ones for this. There were other spring sports where they had different protocols. But if you're going to have these rigid protocols, which really in some ways go all the way back to what you were doing last fall, mm -hmm. then you needed to do what you did in Indianapolis, which was separate the teams from fans, from yeah. anybody. Yeah. For instance, if this baseball team had not been allowed to go back to the team hotel and be around all their fans in the lobby, mm -hmm. what happens then? You don't get this spread to this unvaccinated player who then gets a bug, he's sick, so they have him tested, and then all of a sudden, oh, now we got a contact trace. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, you're telling a bunch of players that they can't play in the game even though they're not sick. That's the old way of COVID. That's last fall, before vaccinations, before they knew a lot of stuff that they know now. And then there's this total hypocrisy of you've got no con no social distancing in the stands. Right. You've, you're not checking people in the stands for vaccinations. You're not testing any of them, but you're basically testing players down on the field who are playing one of the most socially distant sports you could have. Yeah. Think about the size of a baseball field. Mm -hmm. And then players are scattered all yeah. over that field. Yeah. So they're not around each other that much except in the dugout. And then again, if you said this, if you instead of the protocols they had, let's say they said, okay, here's what we're going to do now. We've got a lot of va vaccinated players, and we know that you can still get it yeah. if you're vaccinated, but you probably don't get sick. And yes, you can still transmit it. So we got to have some new rules here. So how about we say, if a player gets sick, yeah. we test him. Mm -hmm. Any kind of sickness, oh, i got a headache, whatever some of these COVID sy systems signs are, I've forgotten what they are from last fall. <laughs> but if you come down with one of these, you say, okay, we test you. And, you, and a player goes and he tests positive. Okay, then you got to get him taken care of. Yeah. You say, you can't play. We want you healthy. You separate him. But you don't do the contact tracing. You don't tell everybody else, well, you were within five feet of this guy for 15 minutes while ago. You, have, you can't play either. Mm -hmm. And that essentially is what the NCAA did. And so then you get be to this whole notion of what I've talked about as long as this show has been on the air. I, I go back to the early 2000s. I was talking about it on radio, which is these suits in Indianapolis, these guys, yeah. they sit back and make their own rules for things. And it's often not rules that you have within the conferences. Right. Look, at, look at what happened when they basically just wiped away the, the college basketball season last year yeah. right during the conference tournaments. They said, they didn't ask anybody. No, they they didn't talk to it. conference officials. They yep. said, it's over, go away. Yep. That sort of higher, uh, we're the higher hierarchy here. We do what we want and you just have no choice but to accept it. Now, let me talk about it in this terms. The NCAA essentially is hired by the member institutions to manage certain things. They come up with rules yeah. for recruiting, rules for operating under certain circumstances, and they set the play, they're in charge of the playoffs in every sport but football. Mm -hmm. So that's what they do. Okay. Okay, let's say I hire a guy to mow my yard. I'm hiring him to mow my yard. Yeah. And I say to him, you know what? I don't like to spend a lot of money on watering every summer. I don't want an enormous water bill. Yeah. So I don't want you to come in and water my yard like this. I want you to allow it up and just cut it even 
and you can come in here once a week and keep it even, but I don't want to scalp my yard, so I have to water to keep my grass from going dormant or dying. And the guy mowing your yard says, I'm sorry, that's not what I'm going to do. I have to mow a certain level, and you're just going to have to accept it. Yeah. Well, that's what the NCAA has done for years to college athletics. They've told these member institutions, nope, we've got our own rules yeah. and our own way of doing things, and you're going to have to do it our way. It's like the schools work for them instead yeah. of the other way around. And I don't know how long it's going to take, but sooner or later somebody's got to wise up to this. Yeah. They've got to change their attitudes. But that's really my take on what happened here. I think they could have played. Yeah. I think they took something away from a bunch of young men they're going to remember for the rest of their lives. Yeah. They're going to be sitting around talking to their grandkids and their old friends, people my age. Hey, I remember when we played that game and they took it away. Yeah. You're going to be doing that. Yeah. And they just don't care. It's well, like too bad you didn't follow our procedures. Well, that's my thing. It, obviously, it's a very sensitive subject and there's a lot of different opinions about yes. it. But regardless of vaccines and protocols and whatever you may think, you're telling me that there wasn't another situation where you could have said, you know what, we're going to quarantine the team or we're going we're gonna to push back, push it back that a game week. a couple days or something. Three or four days, whatever Anything, you have to do. Instead of just saying, well, bye. Yep, which I mean, is what, what, they what if did. they had won? What if they had beat Vanny with 13 players? Did they still kick them out? No, then the national championship gets declared by default. Right, so it's just, that's just crazy to me. So this Mississippi State, I guess, would win it. And that it makes you even more mad about what, exactly. how this is all happening. Exactly. So, okay. All right. Let's move on. Our next question is from Lanny, and he says, if vaccinations don't mean anything, what's to stop us from having this game cancellation stuff in football all over again? Are we really going to go through another season of this? Well, I it's not clear. Not. I guess if they keep this, this if they apply it, here's the one good piece of news. Mm -hmm. The NCAA does not control the college football season. Yeah. It just controls playoffs, and it doesn't control the college playoffs. So I think we're safe for the college football season. There's nothing to stop them to come back, though, in, in these other sports, yeah. fall sports, and say, no, you know, here are our protocols. If you don't, if you don't have 100% vaccination, we can test you, and then if somebody gets sick, we can test anybody, and we can rule you out. Mm -hmm. um, I think what may be going on here, you'd have to be in Mark Emmert's head and all the right. suits in Indianapolis to try and figure this out. I think what may be going on here is they may be trying to force schools to require vaccinations. Oof. Now, I talked to Hunter Juracek last week about this. He said Arkansas is about 85% with their athletes. Yeah. He said we're not telling everybody else they have to get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. That's not our place right. to do that. We are encouraging them to do that. We may explain to them the problems that could result, yeah. but we're not going to force them. And so what may be at work here is the NCAA shoot, uses this as an example, and they hope what then happens is a coach ends up saying to his football team or his basketball team, uh, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to require you last five guys to be vaccinated or we're not taking you with us on the bus because we don't want, want to take the chance on you ruining our season. I don't know if that would ever happen, yeah, just, but it's almost like they're trying to force that to I happen. Know. I just don't <clears> know how you can force. I don't either, but that may be Especially what's Especially college it. athletes. I don't know how exactly. you can force college athletes well, to do that. And then there's this whole issue of the, the, the CDC is known for probably since last fall, early fall, late summer. The data has showed that these, these college age athletes who are in good shape anyway, when they test positive, they send them to quarantine and they come back, they may have a few mild symptoms, a lot of them don't have any symptoms at all, yeah. and they don't go to the hospital, they certainly don't die. And so, the, the, look at all, I asked Hunter Juracek about this, I said, yeah. did any of you, your, the players, did, did any of the athletes in your whole program that got tested and tested positive over the last year. academic year, did any of them get sick, really sick, and have to go to the hospital? He said no. Some of them had some mild symptoms. Some of them had no symptoms. Yeah, and majority. Then, and then they came back after yeah. they were quarantined. So again, we're not looking at what's really going on here. Yeah. We're, we're just a, applying a rigid standard. I still remember last fall on this show, I said some things, then I went on Twitter, and people were accusing me of wanting athletes to die because yep. they were gonna start dying left and right. Nobody died. 
Yep. You know, as Hunter Urichek said, none of them even got real sick. Yeah. There were a few of them had mild symptoms. Like a cold. Yeah. So it w we weren't endangering these people. I at some point, when you have all this data, I mean, the rest of us have moved on. Do you have to wear a mask here? And, you know, Fayetteville's a pretty liberal place. Yeah. We had to wear a mask in a lot of places until recently. But now we're back to normal. Mm -hmm. But we're not back to normal with athletes. Yeah. Why? Just... This is so I pressure. don't know what's going to happen next fall or beyond. Yeah. But when when the NCAA is involved, I think you have reason to be worried. All right. Our next question is from Stu who asks, care to comment on the NCAA's actions against North Carolina State baseball team at the College World Series? Seems a bit fishy to me. Okay. Now, this is a little bit different because he seems to be suggesting that maybe they had an, another motive. An agenda. We don't want North Carolina right. State in this championship I don't game. Think that's it. We want Vandy to win again. Like I don't I don't even I don't believe as that. much as I dislike the NCAA, I don't believe they did it for that reason. I think they did it for the reasons we've talked about, yep. maybe trying to force vaccinations, maybe just saying, hey, we had these rules and you didn't, you knew going in that uh, yeah. everybody needed to be vaccinated and mm -hmm. you didn't do that, so you took the risk and you paid the price. Yeah. That's the way they work. Again, it's the kind of, it's my way or the highway approach yeah. that they've taken to just about everything. And so we'll see. There were other teams though that had players who were unvaccinated, by the way. Yes. I know that that's a big opinion on online. And what what I've been reading is that, like, they were the only team yes. that had players. But where that they vaccinated. had the problem was one guy right. got what they called the bug. Mm -hmm. We don't know what that means. Whatever he could have had the sniffles, was. or <laughs> yeah. could have had a headache, or whatever. He got yeah. a bug, and then they were they did the right thing. The North Carolina State yeah. people. They said, okay, we we need to test you. And then when they did, they unleashed Pandora's Everything. box. Yeah. Everything just blew up. All right, Peak Hog asks, if the SEC leads the charge to separate itself from the NCAA, do you think other Power Five conferences would follow? And how many more nails in the coffin do we need to get rid of these cronies? Well, I don't <laughs> think anything's going to happen soon. At least yeah. I haven't heard of any movement or anything. I, I think before we would ever get to a point which they would ditch the NCAA, you would probably see them trying to force changes. Mm -hmm. And I don't even see that yet. Um, I do think if it happens, it would start with the SEC, the ACC, yeah. and the Big Ten, Big 12. They were the three schools last year that rejected this notion. Keep in mind that the, even though the NCAA doesn't control college football, there was a definite attitude coming out of Indianapolis mm -hmm. as we approached last fall of we shouldn't play, it's dangerous. Right. And then the Big Ten and the Pac-12 uh, said, no, we're not going to play. Mm -hmm. So those three conferences I mentioned got together and figured out a way to make it happen. Yep. We now know they succeeded. We also know they put so much pressure by doing it on those other two conferences that they backed down. Yeah. But they really messed up the season for a lot of oh, their yeah. teams because they missed games. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think if it ever happened, if they ever led a charge against the NCAA, it would start with those three conferences. Now, would the other two follow? I don't know. That would be really interesting. Yeah. But again, as I said before, I think what would happen is you'd have to get a somebody like, you know, Greg Sankey and maybe the commissioners mm -hmm. of two other conferences I mentioned, and they need to go to Mark Emmert and say, bub. Yeah. You better buy him dinner. Right. He said, look, man, you better you get, better, get on the same page. We got to get on the same page yeah. here or we're going to have to do something else. And we're serious about this. Yeah. Then maybe they, we'd see some well, changes. I mean, it, it does seem like the landscape is is definitely changing, though, in general. I, I, I mean, think that more doesn't and mean more you get people are becoming but. aware of how autocratic they are. Right. It's again, it's my lawnmower yeah. analogy. I hire you to mow my yard, but you're telling me how you're going to mow it exactly, instead yeah. of me telling you because I'm paying you. Yeah. All right. Uh, Alex for hog 88 says, what are your top five moments of the 2021 baseball season? OK, we got some graphics on this, so it won't be just me <laughs> talking here. So I'm going to go with number five, Robert Moore's ultimate home run bat flip after the that rally South epic. Carolina. Uh, crowd taunted him for being small, I guess. Yeah, the Oompa Loompa. <laughs> yeah, that, that, I don't know. I don't know they, what that is. I, I'm not cool on Oompa Loompa. Oompa Loompa. I don't know Oompa Loompa. Oh, but, I, but I understood. Charlie, Charlie's. I understood the concept. They yeah. were making fun of him for being little, right. and he hit two home runs on him, including that one, which was really cool. 
Let's go to number four. Jalen Battles, home run against Tennessee in the SEC Tournament Championship game. By the way, he went three for four in that game. Arkansas won seven to two. And he was named the tournament MVP. Yeah. Uh, so, and that was Dave, Dave Van Horn's first SEC tournament title. So, that was fun. Battles goes in at number four. Then number three, Charlie Welch's walk-off <laughs> ninth inning RBI double in game two of the Florida series. Yep. That gave Arkansas its first outright SEC championship. Uh, under Dave Van Horn, and it allowed Arkansas to go 10-0 and in SEC series, awesome. a perfect. That's only been done, I think, one other time. So that was a big deal, that home run. Anybody, it wasn't a home run. It was a double. It was yeah. counted as a double. And it was a, boy, it was a big moment. at awesome. bomb. And then we got to go to number two, and it's Welch again. again. <laughs> yeah, this time with that eighth inning three-run home run against Nebraska. It went from a 3-2 game to, I think, a 6-2 game just like that. Mm -hmm. People went bananas. Yep. And... Uh, that was that was huge. That yeah. sort of the fans already liked Charlie Welch. Now it was that, like, like he became cemented. he became hero status yep. after that one. <laughs> and then number one, this happened just right after that. They brought Kevin yep. Copps in uh, oh. to erase the Huskers in the uh, eighth, the ninth inning of that. Well, they didn't bring him in. He'd already been in. Right. <laughs> but he by coming in and erasing them in the ninth, this was the biggest thing I saw all year. He went seven innings and scoreless innings through 90 pitches 90 pitches seven innings they don't score a run off yeah. him and Arkansas Wild. keeps its hopes alive as we know now they went into the super regional yeah. and got eliminated but they were looking at not even making it past their own regional yeah. and, and so those two guys Charlie Welsh with the home run and then Kevin Copps uh, with that tremendous yeah. seven inning performance yeah I remember I was talking to Wicklander about the the seven innings from cops and he was said that he was just playing catch out there in the bullpen said, being I'm like not, I'm, not, I'm not going in that game <clears throat> this is this is Kevin's game he knew yeah he knew. absolutely he also, and also yeah he also had pitched two days earlier yeah. so it was a total of 161 pitches no run scored just during wild. that stretch yeah that it's was hard, the ultimate Kevin cops hard not to have him as has the number one number one all right um, Alabama hog asks Given the turnover in the football staff, what is your perception of the new staff? It's a little bit difficult because I like to judge people on their work, and we're going right. to have to see during the football season yeah. how this goes. I would start with Kenny Guyton because he was the first one of those guys hired, mm -hmm. and we were able to see his wide receivers in spring football, and they yeah. did a good job, mm -hmm. and we're hearing good things you know, from the wide receivers, yeah. so that looks like a good hire. Now, he had worked with uh, Kendall Bryles before. Right. At Houston, mm -hmm. so you know you like the fact that there's a connection. There's a, a an assistant coach on the staff that's telling Sam Pittman, "I want this guy," yep. and and if you trust Bryles, then you got to trust this was a good move. But yeah. again, we still want to see during the fall how he of does. Course. Now, Cody Kennedy, he's the new old line coach, but he, if you remember, he was the guy that was brought in uh, when Brad Davis went to LSU. Mm -hmm. Well, again, this is a guy that had worked with Sam Pittman yeah. at Georgia as a grad assistant. And then he went on to Tulane and had two good years there where they were nationally ranked in rushing. And, and so the O-line did a good job there. But, again, if you're looking at it of here's Sam Pittman hiring a guy and then moving him into that O-line position, yeah. and people figured that's where he thought he was going to end up anyway. Right, so he was supposed to be tight Because ends. Sam Pittman was one of the best assistant or one of the best offensive line assistants in the country. Yeah. And so he should know who would be a good old line assistant yeah. coach. So I think, you know, at least Sam Pittman thinks that's a good move. And Michael Shearer, he's the guy that was kind of like an analyst yeah, on I the think staff. We all were kind of a little confused about that one. Well, but, here's uh, what happened. The week that Sam Pittman had COVID, if you'll remember, Barry Odom took over as head coach. Well, yep. it was Shearer that then t coached the linebackers. Yep. And I guess he did a good enough job that week yeah. that Odom said, okay, now that we've, we, we've, we've, we've lost our defensive line, our linebackers coach, mm -hmm. and I think that linebackers coach was gone because of some rec they just wanted a better recruiter. Yep. So he gets moved into that probably on the advice of Odom, who, you know, Sam Pittman's going to, he thinks a lot of Barry Odom. So, right. again, that looks good. And then we got Daryl Loggins. This is the one where everybody's kind of not sure of Yeah. <laughs> you know, Loggins was uh, – a quarterback's coach and an offensive coordinator in the NFL for a number of years at several teams. Okay. No ties to the tight ends. But I think if you ask Pittman, he would probably say, look, I mean, he can to coach tight ends. He can yeah. coach any position on the field. He's been around football. Mm -hmm. He knows it, and he's a smart guy. 
But we're going to have to see on that. Of course, yeah. We're going to see after how that works. They do seem to be recruiting well at that position, yeah, so true. maybe he's a good recruiter. And there's also a general belief. I've kind of went around and looked and talked to some people I know, and at least some of them believe that Kendall Bryles cannot stay as the offensive coordinator and, and quarterbacks coach much longer. They think he's going to get a head coaching job. It's just a matter of time. I mean, might not be wrong. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and what they're saying is that Pittman brought Loggins in so that he As can do the same thing when he moved the tight ends coach the, to the yeah. old line coach. He will do the same thing if Kendall Bryles leaves. Now, I don't know if any of that's true. I think that's speculation. Yeah. But that's what a lot of people are saying is that he's not really being br brought in here to coach the tight ends. Yeah. He's going to be the next offensive coordinator. Maybe. And if he works here for a year or two under Bryles and, and sort of sees his system, yeah. then maybe he institutes that system after he takes over and there's kind of a seamless transition. That's so, true. I mean, he's got a lot of experience yeah. in that area. Um, but it, I go back to the bottom line. I, I we, can't we evaluate these guys until we go through a football season and yeah. see how the various positions do. All right. Cowhog32 wants to know, if you could schedule one future game for each big three men's program, who would you play and at what venue for football, basketball, and baseball? Fun question. I think it's already been done. I think, the, the, I think these games have, that okay. I would schedule have already been scheduled, so I don't I'm have curious. to do it. And I'll start with the Texas game. Yep. I, I can't think of a better game that should be scheduled, and now it is scheduled. So it's been scheduled for a long time. They're just going to play time. it. So yeah. everybody wants the Longhorns to come in here. That would be great. Yeah. Then in basketball, we just found out what last week that Bob Huggins is bringing his West Virginia team yeah. in as a part of the SEC Big 12 Challenge. I, I don't think they've ever played hit, hit any of his teams. Mm -mm. I think they played West Virginia once years ago, but this would be exciting. But, yeah. He, he's a personality, yeah. Bob Huggins is, right. and he's coming here. So, you know, play them, play at Bud Walton Arena. I think that would be great. Be packed Bud Walton Arena. And then I can't, I, look, the SEC baseball schedule is not out yet for next year. Right. But I'm assuming that LSU is going to be on it. You almost oh. play everybody in your, in your part of the division yeah. all the time. So I'm going to assume LSU's on it, and I'm assuming they're coming here. Okay. And they've got this new coach. What's his name? Jay Johnson from yeah. Arizona. That'd be interesting. I like and that. so what better way to introduce him to the SEC than say, hey, <laughs> welcome to friendly Bomb Walker yeah. Stadium. We are going to beat the snot out of you. <laughs> so that would be great. So I think that those three great. games have already been scheduled. Or like one that. of them's a series, and I think it's great. You didn't think the Notre Dame football game would be on the on one of your top three? No, I, don't. Nah. I would okay. much rather see... Texas. Play Texas here than Notre Dame, wherever. I don't care about Notre Dame. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. All right, PG Hog One says, with the Rice game being at one on Labor Day weekend, it will be hot when Hunter Yurchak has a press conference. Could you or someone at Pig Trail Nation ask him why the game can't be at night since it's not televised? Well, there's really, really control. no point in asking him because yeah. he doesn't have an option because that right, game is on television. It's not on normal broadcast television, right, but it's but, online, mm -hmm. it's on SEC Plus or SEC ESPN3. One of the many ESPN channels One of those online. things. So y you, know, you can get it on your computer. Yeah. And it's a part of the SEC football package. And you as an individual school in the SEC cannot decide which games right, you want on to. Yeah, you can't decide that. You, ha you get told every year you're playing this team this week at this time. Right. And you just go along with it because yeah. you make about $50 million off that <laughs> stuff or whatever. Nobody's going to reject it right. off the total package. Yeah. Now, why are they doing that? Because especially that time of the year, which is early September, most of these SEC teams are not playing each other, which if you've got a regular season, if you're in the regular season when everybody's playing each other in a conference game, seven games, 14 games become seven because yeah. you're each playing each other. But here you've got 14 games potentially. I haven't checked to see if there is that weekend. But when you've got 13 or 14 games involving SEC teams, I don't care if you've got ESPN, ESPN2, ESPN yeah. U, ESPN <laughs> Business, whatever They're they busy. all have, and ESPN3. It's hard to get all of those games oh, in. Oh, yeah. Especially if you said, well, we're not gonna we're not gonna do any of these games at one o'clock because it'll be hot. We don't yeah, want fans. Yeah, you can't do that. It's just not gonna happen. Yeah. So the only answer is 
And I've seen it before, believe it or not, and I know we've got that hot thing going on out in Portland and oh, everybody's yeah. saying That's global crazy. warming and we're burning up and all <laughs> this stuff. But it, it's always interesting to me, whenever it's unbelievably hot somewhere, it's mm -hmm. not so hot somewhere else. And it hasn't been very hot around here, has it? Not no, lately. It's been nice, true. and it's rained a lot, too. <laughs> yeah, good point. So good point. maybe what will happen the second week in September is we will have a cool front, not a cold front, but a cool front blow yeah. through. And instead of it being 95 degrees, maybe it'll be 88 degrees, yeah. and you won't roast. We, we can we, always We hope. can wish, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fingers crossed. All right, Texas Grocery Hog wants to know, what do you recall being the game or moment in the Bielema era and Morris era tenure that has gone south? Oh, that you recall thinking this tenure has gone south and I don't know if this guy can recover. Is there a moment that sticks out to you when you had a feeling it was the beginning of the end? Definitely for Bielema, it was a South Carolina game of his last year, I think it was 2017. We were at that game Arkansas really needed to win that game. If you look down the schedule, if they lost that game, you're probably looking at another losing season. Yeah. I, I figured he would have a hard time surviving that. But there were additional issues in that game. Austin Allen got hurt in the second quarter. He was trying, he was running, and somebody grabbed his arm and it did something to his shoulder. And the next time he was on the field, it was obviously he couldn't throw the ball accurately anymore. Yeah. Brett Bielema had this issue where he would almost have to be dynamited to replace his starting quarterback when yeah. he was injured. Remember that game at Missouri where Brandon Allen was just totally messed up and he was going downhill and he kept playing him and yeah. he could, they couldn't move the ball? And all he had to do was put another quarterback in there. At least you've got a shot. Well, he did that in this game, but he waited until they were so far behind they couldn't catch up. And that was the game that Cole Kelly came in, I think, in the fourth quarter and had an amazing fourth quarter. I remember thinking at the time if they had put Kelly in when it became obvious that Austin Allen was hurt in the mm -hmm. second quarter, they wouldn't have gotten this far behind and they might have won the game. So I'm sitting there thinking, they're going to look at all this stuff. Yeah. All the people that make the decision, they're going to look at this and go, Whoa, this well, guy, is, he, he's just losing it. Mm -hmm. we, you know, he can't make it. And indeed, that's what that's happened. Yeah. They, they, he got fired. Now, with Morris... I did, it was the last game that he coached, the Western, Western Kentucky, Kentucky game. And I'll tell you why I waited that long to really kind of think he's gone. Because I didn't, most of the time, you almost never see a coach fired after two seasons. Yeah. I don't know if it's ever happened here. It may have 1912 or something. I know it wouldn't have been 12, <laughs> but somewhere in the past. A long time ago. It could have happened. But yeah. I, I don't recall any coach. At least, I, re, I think you generally get three years. Jack Crow got two years in one game. And he's, yeah. he was sort of like, whoa. I would that, think two years, but like he didn't even finish. He the, didn't finish so two years. That's he why ended I up think less we than Crow. By it, yeah. And I just didn't see any way that would happen. But then when they not only lost to Western Kentucky, but yeah. you saw Ty Story 100% mm -hmm. better than he was when he was here. He goes to another school, a school like Western Kentucky, yeah. and their coaching staff develops him as a quarterback, whereas Arkansas didn't. And they saw how yeah. much better he was, and then they just beat Arkansas yeah. into the ground I mean, that day. He just picked Arkansas apart that day. I remember thinking, well, we, th we all thought it might be announced. We th I tell you what we thought. We yeah. didn't think he would be there at the press, the press conference. press conference. We're talking. We're, you and I, I think, yeah. were back we here. Yeah, we were there. But, but we were, t I don't know, were you at the stadium? Yeah, I was there. Okay, well, then I was back here with somebody. I re might, might have been Alyssa, but I remember we were talking with whoever was there. Maybe yeah. it was you. And we were saying, Tell us if he doesn't show up. Yeah. And then all of a sudden we got the word. He's there. He's there. And we were like, whoa. It was taking an abnormally long time. And it's, it wasn't like, you know, new for them to take a long time to come out for a press conference. But it was a really long time. And we so thought, we okay, that, yeah. he's not showing up. We're going to see Hunter Juracek try right, out that's here. that's what we thought. And, he's gonna, and then he showed up, and it was ridiculous because he ends up getting asked, do you think you could still – coach this football team yeah. and get it done. Yes, I can. And then within the next day, he was gone. Yeah. So that's kind of the long answer to that question. All right. Hogan in the Ville says, Arkansas has had some highly drafted baseball players over the years. When thinking about the players that have either had good MLB careers or drafted high, how do you feel about our guys this year? Um, I'm going to start with uh, Christian Franklin. Mm -hmm. He's when he goes through the minor league system, he's going to have to become more consistent at the plate, hit yeah. for a little better average. But he's got power. 
Yeah. And when you're when you play center field as well as he does, and you hit right. home runs like he does, I think he's got a chance. Mm -hmm. I, I can't say for sure because nobody you just knows. Never how know. Every time you move to another level, well, different things can happen. And that MLB system, by the way, that minor league system is just brutal. Yeah, it is. It's tough. Very tough. Yeah. So we'll see, but I think he's got a shot just because of his power and because of the way he plays center field, and I think the only thing he needs to do is become more consistent at yeah. the plate. All right, cops, boy, geez, <laughs> that's, that's a toughie. Here's the thing with cops. It's whether or not players at that level, especially if he's going to make it to the major leagues, whether mm -hmm. those guys are going to figure out that gyro ball or whatever it is. Yeah. Because we started to see toward the end of the year, I think Tennessee hit him decently. Yeah. I think uh, they were North Carolina State started hitting him yeah. some. It, it, it wasn't that they knocked him out of the out. Of, but, well, he ended up leaving that one game yeah. after, had, in the ninth after he'd given up a home run. But he hadn't. It's not like he'd given up multiple runs in, right. in an inning. So here's the thing I would say about that: even if they figure that pitch out a little bit where they can hit it some. He doesn't have to dominate in the major leagues the way he did now. He mm -hmm. doesn't have to have an ERA of .9. Nine. Yeah. And he's not going to throw 160 pitches on, yeah. in a week. He might come in and do an inning here, an yeah. inning there. And he's demonstrated that he's good at that. Yeah. So I think he's got a shot. It's just, again, whether or not they can figure that pitch out and, yeah. then, he, and then whatever else he does with his pitching. He's gonna, he, right. he, he has other pitches, but how effective – they are at that level. So again, it's it's kind of a wait and see. Opens. Um, defensively, he's all you're looking for. Right. He's just got a hit. Which, and that's why yeah. he, w what this year was supposed to be all about. He was going to yeah. try to develop as a better hitter. We didn't up his average. So that didn't happen. What I've noticed in both of those years, last year and this past season, he tends to, to be a clutch hitter at times. Yep. He came up with and some especially big at the end of the year this year, he, he really became more valuable to yeah. them. So again, if he can, if he can develop, maybe as even if he's a 250 hitter at the major league level, 240 or whatever yeah. with his skills, and if they if he can hit a home run occasionally, if he can mm -hmm. get a good RBI at occasionally, he might he might make it. I'm not sure. Again, I'd say it's odds are probably a little bit against it, but I think he can make it. Robert Moore, I think he's in. Yeah. That's not next year, but the year right, after. Right, I was about to say, he's still too I young. mean, with his dad, first of all, everybody's telling me his dad's the one that'll draft <laughs> him now. <laughs> he I, might. I don't know if he will or not, yeah. but this kid's a dynamite second baseman, could probably also play short. Mm -hmm. He hits for average. Yep. He hits for power. What else do you want? He's pretty well-rounded. I mean, I think there. he's got a shot. He, he may not win it, but I think he would be an early uh, – you know, player of the year pick, you know, golden yeah. spikes for next year. He might, he might could happen if Arkansas had a great year. So yeah. I think Moore's in. Caden Wallace, I like him. Yeah. He, he could play outfield. He could play third base. He could, he hits, he's got power. And he was just a freshman this right. year. So he had some clutch hits You too. think, you know, if he improves next year and then he's got another year after that, I think he's got a shot. Now, okay. Charlie Welch. Uh, the only thing about him is he's got to become a position player, and that's what next year yeah. will be all about. They got to find a spot for him, show that he can do this defensively because he's got everything you're looking for at yeah. the next level. He can hit for average. Yep. He can hit for power. He just needs to be able to play a position. I don't know they're going to draft him just as a. Right. They might okay. draft him as a pinch hitter. I don't know if anybody would I'm carry curious, him what just as a pinch hitter. He would. He well, we'll play. find out. Yeah. <laughs> they say he can play infield, outfield, yeah. do a lot of things. So and we'll the, see. the thing you mentioned, cops. I, I feel like a lot of people you would you see all the awards he's won and the recognition, and a lot of people think, oh, that means he's going to get drafted really high. I don't think that's the situation no, no, it's at not. all. It's not. Um, all right. Doctor Starks wants to know who's the best hog player that you've seen in football, basketball, and baseball. I would go with Darren McFadden in football, okay. but Matt Jones would be really Real close. a close second. <laughs> really a close second. I would go with Sidney Moncrief in basketball, but Joe Johnson would be a <laughs> really close second. Baseball, until this year, I would have said Jeff King. There's no question it's Kevin Cops. There's never been, I've never good. seen a player yeah. have that kind of year, that kind of impact. Yeah, it's just so unbelievable. It would, be, it would be Cops. All right, I think we've got our last question for you, Mike. It is okay. from Austin Hog Fan says, as a fan, I feel the momentum in football, men's basketball, and baseball 
From what you can see, do you feel this upcoming recruiting class in each sport appears to be taking us another step forward, or at least in baseball, keeping us near the top? It's just gotten completely crazy with basketball. <laughs> I, I think, but I think Eric Musselman in, in two seasons now going into his third has yeah. turned Arkansas into a top five program. I think Ooh. top five. The recruiting is right there. He, what a lot of people aren't noticing right now is he's still continuing to recruit freshmen and getting yeah. a no, notice from really top quality freshmen. Uh -huh. So he's not giving up on bringing in freshmen. No. But what he's done with the portal is he's sort of become the the John Calipari of the portal. <laughs> he's out Calipari, Calipari. Yeah. Because now what Calipari always did was he brought in these, you know, five star freshmen that were there for a year and what happened was they were good but they weren't they weren't experienced enough, especially mm -hmm. at the start of the year, it hurt them. Yeah. So they were inconsistent. When you bring in some of these fifth year guys, they're so experienced and you get who you're looking if you if you bring in who you want to fill a need, yeah. you're actually better off they're, they are a one and done, but maybe better than a one and done freshman right. because of, of their experience level. So he's sort of done with one and done uh, transfers, what Calipari did with one and done freshmen, right. and I like this idea better. I do too. And then with the one time transfer only, mm -hmm. that just increases bringing in any other transfer. Yeah. So he's really, it's really a good combination of getting good freshmen. And they're not just getting guys in state or getting looks from guys in state. They they brought in some, some guys California. from out of state that are really. Yeah. I think there's a five star in that bunch. There was. Yeah. So, I think basketball has gone to that next level. <clears throat> now, baseball. To me, they were already top five. Yeah. And when you throw in the kind of year that they had, <clears throat> and the fact that they're getting ready to open up maybe next week or so that uh, pr new performance center, yep. which is fabulous. I think they go up even more, maybe to top three. And I just think it's a matter of time until he wins a national championship. I think his recruiting is going to be good every year. Mm -hmm. As always in baseball, though, there's this fine line between bringing in guys that you think you can keep. Yeah. There are some guys you have to get commitments from that you know you're probably going to lose, lose. because you might possibly get them. So you yeah. can't just not recruit them. Yeah. But it's really how well you manage your recruiting to get guys that you have a good feeling. This guy's really good, and he's, he may show up. Yeah. But I see, I see baseball is moving up even higher than top five. Football, <clears throat> Sam Pittman had a much longer way to go when he took over oh, yeah. than those other two coaches. Without a doubt. Um, he's, I, I think he started that first year a little bit outside the top 25. I can't yeah, remember where Arkansas's right. recruiting was, but it was, I don't think it was in the top 25, but it was right outside. Then last year, I think it was lower top 25. I was hearing early in the year that he was up around 14th, 12th, 13th, 14th in that range. I don't know if it's dropped any. Yeah, I'm not sure. But if he's in that range, 20 to 15, somewhere in there, I think mm -hmm. that's a good sign. And then you just keep trying to move up. Yeah. That's what you do. And that's how you get better and better and better. Right. So I, I think it's looking good in all three of those sports. Just going to take longer in football. Yeah, understandable. All right, that's going to wrap it up for our Ask Mike edition this week. For Mike Irwin, I'm Tara Talmadge. Everyone, thank you so much for watching.